three definitive reasons that Ellen White was and is a false prophet. There's more, but we'll just settle on three. She preached to men. You can't say things like that. This is why I learned that word misogynist. Because you're a bad person, you pig. How dare you say something like that? Well, let me show you why. 1 Timothy 2, starting in verse 11. He says, let the women learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, you may not actually know this, but if you are born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, sealed until the day of redemption, you are sanctified, you are set apart for the Master's use, you are now enlisted. You are part of the infantry. You are part of a battle that is much bigger than you, bigger than our family, bigger than our nation. As hard as it is to conceive of, the center of biblical prophecy is not the United States of America. There are actually things that are bigger and of more concern to God than just our particular nation, family, and how things work out for us. But you're part of this battle. And as any battle, there are infantry, there are soldiers, there are horsemen, there are those that are artillery. I don't know what particular position that you fill, but not only do we have soldiers, so does the enemy. Now, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, he says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors. That sounds pretty appealing to me because I'm not much on infantry. But you might be saying, well, I don't really feel like I'm qualified to do that. Well, in John 13, 16, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. See, he's part of this battle, too. Part of his mission, his mission particularly, was ministering to the children of Israel. But he sent others after him to minister to the rest of the world. And he didn't set apart a particular class of people. That's why when you read the very end of, end of the Gospels, he just says, go. He doesn't say, you go, you go and the rest stay home. He just says, go, and sends all of us out with a commission. Now, unfortunately, we do have an enemy that is greater in number, scope, and sometimes even greater in motivation than the rest of us. And these angels of light, these emissaries for the kingdom of darkness, have their own particular fighters, their own particular soldiers. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. You know, I like that in there. It's pretty plain. It doesn't say that they are the apostles of Christ, but it says that they transform themselves into the apostles of Christ, that they perpetrate a fraud, as it were. They put on the front and the appearance that that is who they belong to. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Now, again, it doesn't really say that he is an angel of light, but he transforms himself into that. Whatever suits his purpose, he can transform himself into and look as though he is everything that we ever wanted. Everything we could ever possibly dream of fulfilling our very heart's desire. He can fit that bill. So therefore, all that being true, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be 
according to their works. Now on the outside, you can look all respectable. You can look godly. Maybe your kids are even well behaved. You and the wife get along. You're pillars of the community. But inside, you're a coiling serpent. You see the tail? That lets you know that that's deceptive. That he's representing the enemy. And there's people that are walking around just like this right now. Now, the main difference, of course, is they have actual faces, but you can use your imagination. See, you never see what's going on behind closed doors. You don't see what's going on in between the ears of individuals. You never really know who it is that you're dealing with. Now, just because they look nice, kind, and respectable on the outside, that doesn't mean that that's what they are on the inside. So let me tell you a little story about the seal of God. Does anyone know from Scripture what the seal of God is? It's the Holy Spirit. It's his mark of ownership. Back in the good old days, this is before 1980, when a dignitary or a royal individual, somebody of great importance, if they wanted to mark a particular document to let everyone that would happen upon it know this belongs to me. Who carries this document is on my business under my authority. So God's seal, the Holy Spirit, is his mark of ownership on you. It says, they belong to me. And furthermore, it says, when you touch them, you touch me. I am backing this person up. But I had an interesting talk with somebody one time about the seal of God. As you might remember last week, since we were talking about Seventh-day Adventists, that their main, one of their main doctrines is that the seal of God is actually the Seventh-day Sabbath. Now, the whole problem with that particular doctrine, other than the initial problem, which is that it's false, is that there's absolutely no scripture whatsoever to back that up. Now, you can chop it up a little bit and sort of twist it to come up with that, but there's no scripture that plainly or even infers that that's the case. But anyway, this was his position. So he asked me, he said, well, you know, what do you think about the Sabbath? And we were locked together in a car about an hour from the house, and uh, we basically just cut loose on each other talking about this particular issue. I went over Ephesians 1.13, where he says, In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And I quoted that to him. And his answer to me was, Well, I don't believe that the Holy Spirit is the seal. Well, that's just what it said. Uh, you don't have to go to Hebrew. You don't have to go to Greek. You don't have to pull out your phone and go through endless commentaries. It just says it plainly in black and white. So that led me to an interesting deep dive discussion over the next couple of years and uh, really trying to study this issue out. And I found out that a lot of people, not just Seventh-day Adventists, suffer from something called cognitive dissonance. Extra points if you can say that fast three times. Cognitive dissonance is the discomfort a person feels when their behavior does not align with their values or their beliefs. So they say that they believe one thing, but their behavior belies that and comes across as something else. You know, we see this so often and probably more, most apparent uh, with sex. Now, just about every Christian I know, nominal or the twice a year Christian, will tell you that, you know, Jesus died for our sins. Jesus is God. Uh, the Bible is the word of God. I believe it all, all the way from the table of contents, all the way to the maps. I just believe the whole thing. But then their behavior says something else entirely. Uh, somebody that lives the same lifestyle that I used to. You know, I used to tell everybody that I was saved. 
as I was robbing my family in order to go and get high. As I was living with my girlfriend, and we had two kids, and you know, you can do all the math there. See, we weren't married at the time, but I was saved. I was, I was born again. I was on my way to heaven. See, I say that I believe one thing, but my behavior says something else. Now, this is not a unique phenomenon to the Seventh-day Adventists, but as for the sake of this discussion, the reason I bring it up, my friend who is a devoted believer, and I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that he is sincere, that he loves God, that he values the word above all else, he just happens to read it with a particular uh, glasses that gives him a certain interpretation that you wouldn't get otherwise. But see, he tells me that he believes the word, that he believes it all, that it's his final authority. Yet on the other hand, he will go a direction that is a complete departure from what the word says. Now, how can you do something like that? Well, it's not just because you're deceptive or because you're uh, wicked or if you're mean. You, my friend, are suffering from cognitive dissonance. Now, unfortunately, there's no medication that gets rid of that other than the truth. Now, cognitive dissonance is also can be described as a psychological phenomenon that occurs when a person holds two contradictory views at the same time. I believe one thing, but I also believe this, and they contradict one another. Now, the seal of God, the reason I use that particular example, is a prime example of that. I believe that the Bible is true. I believe this scripture that says the seal of God is the Holy Spirit, but I also believe someone else that tells me it's something else, even though the two things contradict each other. You know, there's a general rule when you come to logic and facts and understanding, and I think the way that you describe it is mutual exclusivity, meaning if this is true, everything else has to be false. Now, just about every one of you are married in here. Now, the way that that works, if you need a refresher, is you are married to one person. When you marry that one person, you are off the market. You cannot be married to another person until you, well, unless you move to Utah and you join the Mormon church and then you do that. But it's mutually exclusive. It excludes you from every other possible option, right? So how can you hold two contradictory and two conflicting views as both being true? That's actually logically impossible. They can't both be true, but they can both be wrong. So tonight, we'll finish up talking about the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church is built upon the testimonies and the visions of Ellen White. If you do not have Ellen White, then guess what? You don't have a Seventh-day Adventist Church. She is the linchpin that holds the entire movement together whether they preach her from the pulpit at what varying levels of esteem that they have for nevertheless her writings her teachings her visions her dreams everything that she wrote over the years they undergird the entire movement of the seventh-day adventist church you can't have it without her so let's open up the scriptures and let's see if there's anything that is taught from the Seventh-day Adventist Church that does not agree with the Bible. Now one such teaching, and I kind of condensed this so you don't have to read the whole thing, is obviously a big part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is keeping the Sabbath. It's right there in the name, the Seventh-day Adventist. So you know that that's something that's important to them. So if you do not keep the law, and if you do not keep the Sabbath, you're a lawbreaker, and really you're at least out of fellowship with God. Now this is how the general teaching goes. 
But what does the Bible say? Let's look. Galatians 2.21. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. It was this very verse that led to me never going back to a Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, as I told you before, I spent about 18 months studying with Seventh-day Adventists about twice a week, uh, doing uh, online courses, correspondence courses, the whole nine yards. Ellen White and I were good friends. We really got to spend a lot of time together. But we were sitting in a meeting, and the setup is a little bit different. It is more like our recovery meetings used to be, where you do have a minister that's preaching, but in between things that he says, if someone has a comment or if they have a question, they'll raise their hand. It's very decent and in order, and someone else will interject, or they'll ask a question. I really like that particular format. I think it works really well. So when the minister was speaking, a hand went up, and this gentleman said, well, you know, I just think it's a travesty that Gentiles think that they can be righteous without the law. Now, I'm sitting there, polite person as I am, and I'm listening, and I thought it was very peculiar that this guy called everyone else Gentiles. Now, there's two groups, of course, that are talked about over and over in Scripture. There are the Jewish people, and then there's the Gentiles, which is everybody that's not the first group. So it's a pretty broad label. Uh, but this guy's not from Israel. He's from Camden. And his family have been in America for as long as anyone can remember. Now, just about every one of us in here, we probably have just a, almost every ethnicity. If you go and have the 23 and Me study done, because... Uh, some of our relatives have jumped every possible fence in, in times gone past. But nevertheless, he is not part of the nation of Israel, and he knows that. So how he can call other people Gentiles, that was the first thing. And I'm going through all this in my head and entertaining myself when it happens. But this scripture came to mind. If I were charismatic, I would say that it was a word of knowledge. But since I'm not... I know that it's what Scripture says, that the Holy Spirit is bringing to my remembrance things that I have heard and things that I have read, things that I've uh, heard preached at other times. And uh, this came right across my brain, just like one of those monitors that has the letters scrolling across. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So I had a particular virus just crouching right at my door, ready to overtake me. It was the virus of cognitive dissonance. Am I going to agree with both of these contradictory statements and try to reconcile them? Or am I going to do the legwork and actually find out which of these two is true? I have someone from Camden calling other people Gentiles and saying that you can't be righteous without the law. And then I have the word of God saying, look, if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Those are two mutually exclusive statements, and only one of those can be true. Now, he seemed like a trustworthy enough guy, but all in all, who has the better track record? Even a church that you have never found any error or any disagreement with, if something is spoken, if something is written, if something is preached that contradicts what the Word says, then they're wrong, period. It doesn't matter how well-liked and well-received and well-spoken any of the messages are. So I left, and I never was to return. Now, another very uh, integral part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the food laws that are kept. Now, you can read most of those in Leviticus. I have a good friend of mine. She said that she loves to read the book of Leviticus. It just brings her great comfort. Uh, it's tedious. It's boring. 
it's like reading stereo instructions. It really is uh, because it's so far removed from our experience. It's not something that we're ever going to experience. So why is it worthwhile to read it? Well, because God not only spoke it, but he thought enough of it to preserve it for all of us. So therefore, it is valuable. And when you read it, knowing the end from the beginning, that all of these rituals and all these burnt offerings and these, they're, we're cutting up doves and we're killing calves and goats and all of this and grain offerings, when you know that that is all a shadow that is pointing to the reality, which is Jesus Christ, then every animal sacrifice that you read about, horrible as, and bloody as it is, you know that that looks forward to him, the ultimate sacrifice that is coming. And then Leviticus just comes alive and it's a little more endearing to read. But anyway, you can read about all the different food laws that are contained in Leviticus, and they are still practiced by and large by the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, back in the early church, and this just goes to show you that Solomon was absolutely correct, that there is nothing new under the sun. Uh, this push towards quasi-Judaism and keeping at least elements of the law is nothing new. Right from the outset, this debate consumed the church. Now, all the bigwigs got together, and they were having a discussion about what part of the Mosaic law should the new believers keep? Should they keep the Sabbath? Should they not eat catfish? Do we need to get them circumcised? Now, all of these different issues came about. So they have a meeting come together, and it's James, Peter, Paul, Barnabas, and they're going to have a discussion and hash it out. Acts 15, verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. So not only to the people that were gathered together, it says that it seemed good to the Holy Ghost. This is God speaking. God has given his word on the matter. So that gives me a lot more comfort to know that just some old white guys didn't get together in the back room and hash out a doctrine. This is God speaking, and this is his word, and this was his verdict. He said that you abstain from meats that are offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled, that would still have the blood in it, and from fornication. Well, he just doesn't understand our modern sensibilities with this last one. From which, if you keep yourselves, you shall do well. Fare you well. Farewell, guys. These four things. Well, what about eating? I only said four. That you abstain from food that's offered to idols, that you don't eat blood, don't eat things that are strangled, and don't fornicate amongst yourselves. Those are your four things that you got to keep with. So this is what not only the apostles, not only those of note within the early church, but what God himself set as a standard for Gentile believers that were coming into the church. Now, you have the four over here. I would do an object example, but I have three fingers, so I can't do four. There you go. There's four. So we got four over here, and then we've got the 613 commands of the Mosaic Law. Both of these can't be true. Only one of these can be true. That's going to be mutually exclusive, right? So is the teaching of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, no matter how well put together, well packaged, and digitally sound and beautiful it is, is that correct? Or is what God said correct? Because it can only be one of the two. Now, to her credit, remember, and we are still talking about cognitive dissonance, but Ellen White did not call herself a prophet. Good job. But... The Seventh-day Adventist Church says that her writings speak with prophetic authority. Now, the Bible teaches 
that we are saved by grace, through faith, apart from the works of the law. But the Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches that the law is legally and morally binding on all people in all places and for all time. I am not really 100% certain how you can confidently come up with that. Uh, because it becomes very apparent just with an open and honest reading of Scripture in Exodus. You don't have to even go anywhere else, but it is very apparent that the law was given to Israel. Over and over again, the statement is made to the children of Israel. Speak to the children of Israel. The children of Israel will do this. It was given to them. And it was also given for a particular purpose and for a particular time it was given to i don't like the image of the law operating like a flashlight like a spotlight looking in the dark corners of our soul it's more like an x-ray where it sees what is on the inside of all of us and what is motivating us Nothing is able to escape from its peering eye, that it sees everything that makes us who we are. And its purpose is to show us how exceedingly sinful that we are. How that no matter how well behaved that we can be, we cannot have the righteousness of God. We cannot behave our way into the kingdom of, into the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? I mean, you're, you're looking at it and you're seeing two contradictory things put together. And it makes me a little uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable having to make that sort of decision. I would just love for just everybody just to get along. We just all get along together and we don't have to have an uncomfortable conversation like, excuse me, sir, you're lying. You're wrong. You're mistaken. Because it makes you feel like a bad guy. And also, if you, you know, start that conversation before dinner, it's really awkward sitting through the whole thing. You do that at the end. But when you have the truth, then you have a responsibility that comes with that truth. I love this line from uh, the old Marvel movies and comics. It says, with great power comes great responsibility. And nothing brings power like truth. Knowledge is power, is it not? And once you have that, you then have the responsibility to uphold that, to speak that in the face of any and all opposition. And God takes it pretty serious. You remember in Romans, I think it's uh, verse 17, chapter 1, where it says the wrath of God. Any statement that starts with the wrath of God, I kind of stand erect because I want to hear what's happening, make sure I'm not going to be caught in the deluge that happens. But he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and wickedness of men. And it goes on to say, And against those that hold the truth in unrighteousness. I know what's right. I know what the truth is, but I'm closely guarding it because I don't want to tip over the apple cart here. I don't want to seem like a, a bigot, a misogynist. I learned that word recently. Uh, so we don't like to have those awkward conversations where we're called to account and called others to account. But if we have the truth, that's part of it. That's part of the fine print. Again, it's like being married. You might not be a... a a boxer or a violent person, but if somebody tries to snatch your wife up, all of a sudden you're a Vander Holyfield. Mike Tyson, that's even better. I mean, because you're going to defend, because that com it's something valuable to you. It's something that matters. It's something that's worth fighting, whether or not you're a fighter or not. And the truth is even more valuable than that. I know I said that in a group of married people, but uh, that would just give you an idea just about how valuable it is. Something that is worth going to the mat over when and if necessary. Let's look at three definitive reasons that Ellen White was and is a false prophet. There's more, but we'll just settle on three. Y'all ready? This is fun.
I'm having fun. Okay. She preached to men. You can't say things like that. This is why I learned that word misogynist. Because you're a bad person, you pig. How dare you say something like that? Well, if I were just coming up with that particular interpretation on my own, then that label might be well earned. But let me show you why. 1 Timothy 2, starting in verse 11, he says, Let the women learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, this isn't due to lack of ability. It's not due to a lack of spiritual zeal, of knowledge, of know-how in order to be able to do it. But he does tell us why this prohibition exists. See, you can't just get mad and then stop reading because then you miss all the important details. But just because you are able to do something doesn't mean that you should. You know, Paul even said that when he was talking about food, he says that all things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. People have asked me that before. I said, well, what does the Bible say about smoking? Well, it doesn't. Hey, look, I mean, if you're an anti-smoker, I get that. I'm not really fond of, fond of it myself, but there is no clear prohibition in Scripture against smoking. There is no definitive prohibition in Scripture against drinking alcohol. There's not. But there is a plethora, a multitude of Scriptures that talk about defacing and destroying the temple of God. Uh, there are so many all the way from, really it starts in Genesis and goes all the way through Revelation that talks about drunkenness. So does the Bible say you should not drink under any circumstance? No. But if you're drunk, it has plenty to say about it. Does the Bible say that you should not smoke? No. But it does say that you shouldn't kill yourself. And the last time I checked, that kills you. The only bad news is, is it kills you nice and slow. That way they can milk every possible dime out of you. But just because you can do those things, that doesn't mean that you should. You're free to choose to do them, but you're not free from the consequences of that choice. Now, this old boy here is Jeff Goldblum. He's an excellent, excellent actor. And he was in Jurassic Park, and he played one of the scientists that they go to the island and come to find out they've cloned dinosaurs from the embryos found in frozen amber from a long time. We'll just say it's a long time. Well, so he makes this statement here. He says, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could they didn't stop to think if they should. This has resurfaced recently when all the discussion about AI online and in chat groups and everyone's talking about it. Uh, we've actually saw just how quick we could move ahead to actually do something, but we never have stopped to really think about if it's a good idea or if there's some far-reaching consequences. Who cares? It's new. Let's do it. I know because I use it too. I'm an artist now thanks to AI I can actually put beautiful artwork together but anyway in the context about what we were talking about here the prohibition against women teaching doctrine to men and preaching to men they may be able to and actually uh, just about the majority of women that I know are highly capable in that area and actually women are more uh, more keen to jump in when they see that vacuum of leadership than men are. If some, somebody needs to teach, somebody needs to preach, hey, look, I've already had to wrangle six wild kids at home. A bunch of angry adults is no problem. And so usually a young lady or you know, a more mature lady is ready to step in, where us guys were like, well, look, I need to pray about it, and then we'll get together and we'll talk it out, and we'll see if that's what we need to do. Meanwhile, the vacuum exists that needs to be filled, and usually women are more apt to jump in and ready to do that. But just because you can 
And just because you have the ability and just because you have the knowledge doesn't mean that you have the blessing of God to go ahead and do it. And he tells us why. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. In other words, this is God's order of authority. This is his structure. This is the way that he set it up. The husband is not the head of the wife because we're the sharpest knife in the drawer. And actually, that's usually not the case. But this is the way that God has set it up to work. Will it work otherwise? Yeah. You can limp right across the finish line. But this is how it was designed in order to work. And if that seems backward, if that seems bigoted, if that seems misogynistic, I, I, don't, I don't really care. And I mean, I say that as kindly as I can, but this is not my church. And furthermore, it's not yours. And it's not anyone else that would hear this message later on where we can set the rules and standards on how the kingdom of God is going to operate. This is his house. This is his church, and these are his rules. But the good thing is the hotline is always open. So if you take issue with that, you can talk to the author and voice your discontent. Now, I find it very unlikely that he's going to change that for you, but at least, in other words, take it up, take it up with him. These are his rules that he set out. And I don't get to pick and choose what I agree with and what I'm willing to follow. Now, you might be thinking, I like loopholes. Any of y'all loophole people where you look at a loophole to see if you can get away with something? Okay, so this was 1 Timothy. So you might be thinking, well, that was just for that particular instance. Okay, that was to that church in that time period. It's not for all people everywhere. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Verse 34, he says, Let your women keep silence in the churches. Paul making friends wherever he goes. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, for they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, your scholars will tell you, and I happen to agree because enough of them have, have said this, that this particular church, you know, the church in Corinth was a bit like Bethel Redding, mixed with a Jerry Springer marathon. They had all sorts of stuff going on. Tongues hanging from the chandelier. They're getting drunk at communion. They're sleeping with each other's stepmoms and all sorts of stuff. They got all sorts of things going on. Now, during the church services here at Corinth, they were prim and proper enough to separate the sexes in their meeting hall. So you've got the men on one side and the women on another. And they're yelling at each other over the aisles. When the preacher's preaching, the wife is yelling out, Hey, what's that mean? And they're having discussions and arguments back and forth. So this was written particularly to address and to counter that. He says, look, if you got something to ask him, ask him when you get home. You got to walk. You got plenty of time to get there. Don't do it while we're all gathering together. But you see, again, this is not just something that is spoken here to this group, to this one particular person, because he repeats it somewhere else. That's what I love about Scripture, is truth is not isolated like that, where you come across it one place and you're just you know, wringing your hands trying to figure it out. It appears somewhere else, and then somewhere else. And like little laser beams, they all triangulate each other where you know that it's God weaving this fabric together and that his truth stands because he gives witness of it over and over again. Now, if you still take issue with that, because you're not supposed to talk about those things, how dare you? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37 says, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Look, I understand if that goes against the status quo, and I understand 
if that is not the culture of the current day. But he says that if, look, if you're a prophet, if you're spiritual, if you're going to say that you're part of this thing, then you acknowledge that what I'm writing to you is the commandments of the Lord. These are his words to you. So he took the same, he, Paul took the same stance, which take it up with the author if you don't agree. Number two, it's not nearly as shocking, I promise. But she plagiarized the works of others. Ellen White plagiarized the works of others. Okay, here, this is the great controversy. Now, this was originally written in 1886, and this is page 76 through 77. Now, over here, we have the History of Protestantism by J.A. Wiley, written a full 10 years prior. What is underlined here are the direct quotes that are copied word for word from the history of Protestantism. Not only did she copy the material, she even copied the artwork. Now, much of this has been altered and changed with the revisions, as things like that often are, but thank you, Internet, that it's not just for cat videos. We have at our fingertips the ability to research any and everything. Nothing is hidden any longer. Now, it is not a sin, and it's not even wrong to take quotes from other authors and to put them into your book, is it? I mean, Wikipedia is built on such information. So why is this such a big deal here? Well, not only were none of these sources, and this is just one instance, not only was the source not given credit, she also passed the inspiration for this book off to God. In other words, God gave me this message to you. Well, apparently, God gave it to J.A. Wiley about 10 years prior because she stole it from him. Now, this and the other preponderance of evidence against her is all detailed in this book. It's called The White Lie by Walter Ray. He was a former Seventh-day Adventist himself, and he has not only images like this, but he has the original footnotes, or he has the original sources that you can see not only where they were taken from and what they said, but how they have been changed with each revision to make it not so obvious. Jeremiah twenty three thirty says, Therefore, behold, I am against the prophet, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. So, God, just like the federal government, takes plagiarism pretty seriously, too. If you're going to steal my words, you're going to steal the works of another person and pass them off as your own, God says, look, I'm, I'm against you. I have turned my face from you. Number three, she gave numerous false prophecies. Numerous false prophecies that not only were determined to be false, after her death, this was in her own lifetime. Now let's look at this one. I was shown the company present at the conference. Said the angel, some food for worms, some subjects of the seven last plagues, and some will be alive and remain upon the earth to be translated at the coming of Jesus. Some of you are going to die, some of you are going to experience the plagues, but some of you are going to live to see the return of Christ. Well, she spoke this at a conference that was gathered in 1856, and they're all dead, every single one of them. I think it's somewhere around the neighborhood of 180 years, give or take, that you would have to be in order to reach this. Now, let's see what the Seventh-day Adventist Church has to say about such a egregious, plain error that you can see was a mistake. Because they say, well, 
yeah, I understand that, but you just got to look at it. Numerous statements made by Ellen White in the decades following the 1856 vision demonstrate her clear understanding that there is an implied conditional quality to God's promises and threatenings, as Jeremiah declared, and that the conditional feature in forecast regarding Christ's advent involved the state of heart of Christ's followers. The following statement, it's written in 1883, is especially relevant on this point. So this, this is the consensus of the ruling body, and the statement that follows is her statement about the failed vision. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. This is from manuscript number four that was written in 1883. It's quoted in Evangelism, page 695 and 696. In other words, look, I know it didn't happen, but the reason it didn't happen is because all of you were bad people because you were unconsecrated and you were worldly and you were full of sin and that's why Christ didn't come. You know, I don't want to, you know, I already got everybody a little upset talking about women aren't supposed to preach to men, so I'll just go ahead and jump in. Uh, this reminds me a lot of what we've experienced in the last few years with the Trump prophets that were on YouTube and social media every single day saying that God told them God told them, not that I think, not that polls suggest, but that God told them that Trump was going to win a second term this election. That got twisted later, but that was what the original message was. And then it didn't happen. Well, then they reinterpreted, and new videos came out, and new exposition on what the facts supposedly were, but still... The prevailing line was that God has shown us that this is going to happen. Now, then after, you know, about two years in, it was pretty apparent that you couldn't squeeze any more money out of this turnip. I did read from one particular guy that says that he's a prophet, and this is Chris Valaton. He's from Bethel Reddy. More on that later. And then there was also Hank Kuhneman. He's also, a, I think he's a traveling prophet at large. Both of them said that, yes, God gave us this prophecy that he was going to win this election. But the reason that he didn't is because wicked men came in and stole it after God plainly said that this was going to happen. Now, no, I do not trust the federal government. I don't really even trust the state government. I'm not even sure that any county officials are 100 percent on the up and up sorry uh, but power does has a tendency to corrupt people but i do know this that once god has said something is going to happen it's going to happen every wicked spirit in the heavenlies every wicked men upon planet earth can gather together and his word will stand you know why i can say that because there's an instance of that that's recorded in Scripture. Right at the very end of the book of Revelation where Satan goes out after being loosed and he gets Gog and Magog of the four corners of the earth and they marshal the entire industrial military complex of planet earth and they're going to take the city. And you know what happens? He speaks one word and wipes them out. Fire comes down from heaven and they're gone just like that. Why? Because you know what? You can't fight City Hall, but you much less cannot fight against what God has said. You can't buck the system here. Once he says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. So if God had promised to return at a particular time, it doesn't matter if Sister Suthie has got too much sin in her life. It doesn't matter if the church is not 
prayed up at this particular time. If he says he's coming, he's coming. But you know what? He didn't say he was coming because he has repeatedly said that I'm not telling anybody. Just as we showed that scripture in Matthew, he says, no man knows the day or hour. Remember that? Well, when he says man, he means the women too. So they don't get to know either. Now, I've also, as I've been studying this, I've read from several sources that this was a conditional prophecy. Therefore, you cannot hold Ellen White to account and say that she was wrong here, okay? Now, I have read it multiple times. I don't see the conditional part of that. But you know what? I'm charitable, so I'm going to give you that one. Okay, cool. But how many false prophecies do you have to give in order to be a false prophet? Just one. The bar is really low. So let's look at a couple. Ellen White prophesied the world would end in 1843, 1844, 1845, and 1851. Here's her quote from 1851. She says, Now time is almost finished, and what we have been six years in learning, they will have to learn in months. This is from her early writings book, page 57. So even if we give you the first one, here's four more that you're false in. Let's keep going. This nation will yet be humbled into the dust. England is studying whether it is best to take advantage of the present weak condition of our nation and venture to make war on her. When England does declare war, all nations will have one interest of their own to serve, and there will be general war and general confusion. This is from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 259. This, of course, was written during the Civil War, and her prophecy was that England is going to declare war, and once they do, it's going to be a free-for-all, and world war is going to erupt. Now, I know they don't teach history like they used to, but I'm pretty sure there's not a history book written that has anything remotely like that. That does not check out. It didn't happen. It, didn't, it wasn't even close to happening. But, again, the explanation given is that you, this is a conditional prophecy, and you can tell. When, in, let's do it together. When England does declare war. I see no condition there. Now, if it was if England does declare war, or maybe, or peradventure, you know, will sound really cool. That sounds very biblical, peradventure. But it says very plainly that when England does, it's a definitive statement of fact. And not only that, you can, you can make predictions like that and be wrong. I mean, you can look at data and you can look at trends and you can say, this is likely to happen. But this is supposed to be the word of God coming. This is God speaking, telling me this is going to happen. Thousands have been induced to enlist with the understanding that this war to exterminate slavery, but now they are fixed. They find that they have been deceived. Now, that's probably pretty accurate. But the, that the object of this war is not to abolish slavery, but to preserve it. This is from Testimonies of the Church, Volume 1, page 254 and page 258. In other words, during the Civil War and after, slavery is going to endure. Actually, and I didn't put that here, she did prophesy again that slavery would only be eradicated by the second coming. Now, I don't know the exact date of the end of the Civil War, but as you remember and probably all know, it did in fact end slavery within the United States. Now, there's still countries in the world today, actually there are more people enslaved today than there have been during the heyday of the African slave trade in the United States. 
in several of the Muslim countries, that's how punishment is meted out to you and your family. You're sold into slavery. So it's still rampant and widespread. But for the sake of this, in, in the United States, it was eradicated from our country. Let's look at another. In the year 1850, Bible scholars were teaching of the return of the Jews to Palestine. Do you know where that word comes from, Palestine? It comes from the Philistines. This name was given to the country that is Israel, basically by those that conquered them in Rome and stamped the rebellion out that it happened in around 70 AD, give or take. So as an insult to the Jewish people, they named their homeland after their most hated enemy, the Philistines. And it was known as Palestine. However, when I speak of the country, I call it Israel. Not because I like to cause dissent and cause controversy. I call it Israel because that's what God named it. And if every map in the entire world calls it Palestine, if every website is updated to call it Palestine, if they somehow come into all of our homes and get those antique little globes, and black mark it out and write Palestine on it, I'm still going to call it Israel because that's what God called it, and that's what its name is. And when Jesus Christ returns and puts his foot on the Mount of Olives, he's going to do so in the nation of Israel. And they're going to ask, what about Palestine? And he says, pal, who? I don't understand what you're saying. This is my home country of Israel because that's who, what God named it. So anyway, in 1850... Now, these Bible scholars got together, and they were teaching about the return of Jews to Palestine and that Israel was going to be restored. So here's what Miss White said about it. She said, I also saw that old Jerusalem would never be built up and that Satan was doing the utmost to lead the minds of the children of the Lord into these things now in the gathering time to keep them from throwing their interest into the work of the Lord and to cause them to neglect the necessary preparation. Early Writings, page 75. So she was shown. She, she saw, see? She saw in vision that old Jerusalem would never be built up. Well, it looks like she got it wrong again. I wonder if that's one of those conditional prophecies. They're conditional on them actually happening. And then when they don't, some other source or some other reason is, said to, is given blame for it. But you can look at images today of old Jerusalem. It is, in fact, rebuilt. Now, they're still lobbing rockets every single day into the city, and they have to rebuild some of those things several times, but it has been rebuilt. Deuteronomy 18.22 says, When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. And your response, dear reader, it says that thou shalt not be afraid of him. If someone speaks in the name of the Lord and it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen 100% accurate in what he said, then you're not to be afraid of them. They can be discarded. They can be dismissed. As a matter of fact, what happened in ancient Israel is they drug you outside the city and they pelted you with rocks until you died. Now, when people make false prophecies nowadays, they just go to another ministry, they get another book deal, they come out with a new video, and we just go on like nothing ever happened in the first place to see just how much water can we get out of the rock. And the bad news is they can always get more because there's always somebody willing to listen. But God's very simple instruction was that, look, if they speak and they say they're speaking for me and it doesn't happen, then don't listen to them. So Ellen White was a liar. Now, how many lies do you have to tell in order to be a liar? One. It's like you can't be, you can't be a little pregnant. You just can't. You either are or you're not. You're either telling the truth or you're telling a lie. 
And if you repeatedly lie to your followers in order for power, money, and control, then this is the nature of the person that deceit has completely overridden their natural senses. And that is all that they can then speak. So next week, we'll look at Oneness Pentecostals, the UPCI International. This is the United Pentecostal Church International. Now, it was difficult enough to prepare for the Seventh-day Adventist messages uh, because I have so many friends that are Seventh-day Adventists. And it's bad enough to disagree with somebody over politics, but when you disagree with somebody over God, then the fur is apt to fly just at any moment. Uh, but this one has been even more uh, difficult because my family predominantly are in this movement for probably two or three generations. You know, I've always been a black sheep in my family. For years, I was a black sheep because I was a dopehead. And now I'm a black sheep because I'm not part of the UPCI. I'm always on the outside looking in. So it's going to be interesting to see the conversations around Thanksgiving or Christmas. But I don't do this sort of thing lightly or for entertainment or just because, hey, we need something to do on Wednesday for an hour. It's because that it's true and the truth is something that is precious that is to be safeguarded and is willing to defend. And if someone else is preaching something, no matter how zealous and good intentional they are, if they're preaching something that is false, then it's false. And it can't stand because we have the responsibility to say, no, that is not right. Because you might not be deceived. Good. Good for you. you know, your pastors might not be deceived. Excellent. But your kids might be or your grandkids, or your third cousin twice removed, you never know how far the deception will reach out into other people groups if it's not stamped out and put to a, put to a stop. So that being said, uh, I'll leave it there for the Seventh-day Adventist. There is more. There's much more. Some people have made this uh, actually, the apologetics against the Seventh-day Adventist group, this is their entire ministry. That's all they do, is they go on speaking tours and write books against. I don't really want to devote that much time to it. And I think most of us here already knew that it either was a cult or was close enough to avoid, and I understand that. But I think that when someone has such a presence in our own backyard, we need to know what it is they believe from their sources and see who they actually are. And I hope that I've done that for you. If you need more information, I can do this all day. And I do sometimes. All right, let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your truth that stands. We thank you for your son that you've given us that you sent Jesus to die for us, to save us from our sins, that you freed us, that you freed us from the condemnation of the law, that you freed us from all the sins that so easily beset us and kept us bound with, sin, with shame and with regret. Lord, that you freed us and given us a hope and a future, that you've given us a life better than anything that any of us could ever dream of or thought possible. And we thank you for your truth that we can hold to, that we can stand on, and that we know in the face of any and all opposition that it will withstand it. And Lord, we love you and thank you. Amen.